has been the case for many years, uh, International Women's Day in this country, in the United States, is not generally celebrated, and in, even though it's a holiday whose origins are in the United States, uh, from uh, at least 1908 uh, demonstrations and uh, rallies and meetings in Chicago and New York and probably other cities. Um, so International Women's Day is uh, particular, of particular significance in Russia because, uh, because six years after the first holidays, the first celebration of International Women's Day in 1911, uh, in 1917, women went out on the streets on International Women's Day and their protests and demonstrations sparked the February Revolution, which overthrew the Tsar. And even though women were very important in, in initiating the protests that led ultimately to the Tsar's abdication, the leaders of the revolutionary governments, there were two really, the provisional government and the Soviets, were reluctant to uh, extend women rights such as the right to vote. And as a result of their reluctance and hesitation, even though they had given other reforms or initiated and acted other reforms right away, such as the abolition of the death penalty um, and eliminating the Pale of Settlement, for which can find Jew most Jews to a particular area of the Russian Empire, they were hesitant to uh, extend such major reforms to women. And as a result of that, um, on March 19th, women, 40,000 women in, in Petrograd, which was then the name of St. Petersburg, um, went out on the streets, took over the public space in the heart of Petrograd, and marched from the city hall to the Torad Palace, which is where both the provisional government and the Soviets were located, and demanded that the leaders of both groups accede to giving women the vote. Very often Russian women, uh, if they're even, if the Russian feminist movement is even given any attention, um, are portrayed as being less militant than their sisters in the West, such as the British suffrage, suffragists, the Pankhursts, or Alice Paul and the National Women's Party in the United States. But in fact, on this day in, Fe in March, uh, when the weather in Petrograd was not warm and balmy, uh, these, this large group of women stood outside the Torah Palace and said, we are not moving until you give us the vote. And finally, after much back and forth um, and meetings with the leaders of the march, Palixena Shishkina Yavain and Vera Figner, who was a revolutionary heroine, um, the leaders acceded to the women's demands, said that they would, in fact, uh, and put into the electoral regulations um, women's having the vote. Um, and the women, as a result of that demonstration, won. And Russia became the first major power in the world to give women the vote. Three years before women in uh, the United States, um, 11 years before all British women got the vote, um, and French women didn't get the vote until 1944. Swiss women didn't get the vote until 1971. So this was a major um, breakthrough for women, but it's one that is really not very well known, even in Russia today or uh, in the West. Let me start by saying that um, the achievement of women's suffrage is one of the major civil rights victories of the 20th century. Um, 
at this point, almost in almost every country in the world, women have the right to vote. What that means is a whole other issue, but still, uh, the fact that the majority of the world's population now has a say in democratic countries and has uh, the acknowledgement of greater rights uh, is a very important achievement. And I think it's important to keep in mind that the great previous rev democratic revolutions, the French and the American revolutions at the end of the, 19 at the, end of the 18th centuries, did not um, extend rights to women and in fact were hostile often to women's rights. Uh, even the rights, the limited rights that women had before were curtailed uh, by the policies of the French and American revolutions once the leaders got into power. With the uh, February and then with the Bolshevik revolutions, particularly after the Bolshevik revolution, the Soviet government adopted the line that uh, was prevalent among uh, party-affiliated social democratic women even before uh, and that they were epitomized really by Alexandra Kollontai and that line was that um, feminism was bourgeois, uh, that it was a movement that was made up almost exclusively of middle-class women and uh, the rights for which they fought were only really of interest to to middle class women and had little effect on working class and peasant women. Uh, I argue in my book that um, against that, uh, for using several, making several points, one of which is that um, we really have to understand the intersections of gender and class and uh, women who are born into middle class families do not necessarily have the same rights as their male relatives because of their gender and that gender dimension has to be understood um, as part of uh, a serious form of oppression that has existed um, since the beginnings of time it seems or certainly since the creation of the system of patriarchy, which uh, which expresses itself in uh, different societies in different ways. So um, to call the feminists bourgeois because some of them came from, and not all of them, came from, uh, from middle class or gentry families is uh, is disingenuous because, in fact, most social activists at the turn of the of the 20th century in Russia came from that same milieu. That is, uh, Kalantai herself was the daughter of a general. Krupskaya, the wife of Lenin, was uh, came from the gentry, went to school with a prominent feminist. Uh, Lenin was a lawyer. Uh, many of the other social democratic male leaders came from the same background as uh, other social activists, including feminist activists. So that's one piece of it. Another piece of the argument is that women's rights had no relevance uh, to working class and peasant women. And it's very clear from um, both the demonstration on International Women's Day, which did include both uh, women from privileged backgrounds and women from the working class, uh, International Women's Day had a wide appeal and its goal at that point from the start of the holiday was women's suffrage. Um, the uh, demonstrations on International Women's Day and then the demonstration on March 19th, 1917 for women's suffrage uh, were both demonstrations in which were cross-class in nature and you can see that from the uh, we don't have a lot of pictures, but we do have a newsreel of the March 19th march, and it's very clear that there are women in that march wearing hats, which is uh, which would be an indication that they were more privileged, and there are a lot of women wearing scarves, which is uh, the typical headgear of working class and peasant women. So the idea that women's rights it doesn't appeal 
to working class and peasant women, I think, among other things, is uh, denigrates uh, their ability to make decisions about their own lives and their and their awareness of their oppression, not only in terms of their economic situation, but also in terms of their gender situation.